was playing around last night, um, trying to figure out what I would preach, and um, nothing came to me. So I woke up this morning and kind of slept in, um, just trying to figure out what to preach, and I couldn't really figure anything out. So during the fellowship break, um, I went and got some toilet paper to write some notes on. Um, so I'm just going to try to kind of see what comes out today. I'm just making all that up. Amen, guys. <laughs> but the title of the lesson today is spiritual apathy. Just don't care. Amen. Spiritual apathy. You're falling out of love with God. Let's pray. Father God, be with our service today. Help us, Father God, to be strong in your spirit. Help us, God, to know you in a deeper way. And uh, Father God, I pray that this sermon can uh, really move the hearts of those who are visiting with us this morning. Uh, God, I pray that, Lord, we can uh, not fall out of love with you, but fall more in love with you, God. And Lord, we love you and we commit this service into your hands, God. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. A lot of you guys were concerned. Amen. Spiritual apathy, falling out of love with God. It's an I don't care type attitude, amen? And I've talked about before, the opposite of love is not hate, right? Hate, hate if you hate someone, that actually means you still care because you're angry about it. But the opposite of love is apathy. It's just not caring at all. You're just kind of like, whatever. That's a scary place to get to, amen? And spiritual apathy has been called by early church or ancient uh, witnesses, if you will, uh, monks, these sort of people, a term called acedia. Now, acedia uh, comes from a Greek word, akedia, which means negligence. It describes a state of just not caring, not being concerned with one's position or condition in the world. It can lead to a state of being unable to perform one's duties in life. Uh, its spiritual overtones make it related to depression, uh, a feeling of just being paralyzed. Uh, you're not able to really get out of bed and, and do anything. It takes a lot of motivation. Second uh, Corinthians chapter seven, if you'll turn there. In Second Corinthians chapter seven. And we're going to look in verse 10. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. See what this godly sorrow has produced in you? What earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. At every point, you've proved yourself to be innocent in this matter, amen? You know, there's godly sorrow, and then there's what's called worldly sorrow, amen? And worldly sorrow was seen by one of the uh, uh, scholars of the medieval times, a guy named Thomas Aquinas, as ascedia, as a form of spiritual apathy. Because when you have godly sorrow, there's an indignation, there's a, a passion, right? When you want to repent of your sin, you, you feel passionate against that sin. You're passionate for God, and you want to see justice done. Are you with me right here, church? Yeah. And so if we're at a place of worldly sorrow, it's really a sign of acedia or spiritual apathy. So what are the signs of acedia in one's life? Sleepiness, sickness, lack of attention. Now, again, all these we all kind of experience from time to time. But this is kind of a general characterization of your life, right? Overall dissatisfaction with life. Boredom. I mean, was Jesus ever bored, you think? A general laziness, a state of restlessness, not able to live in the present, um, seeing the future as overwhelming, a lack of caring, being unfeeling, don't cry, you just don't feel a lot about things, lacking commitment, and hopelessness. Um, Kim McKean, who's the leader of our movement, wrote a really great article on acedia. And he goes through some of the history of it. I'm just going to read a, a portion of it for you. It says, the word acedia has been lost in the modern English language, and it's forgotten about as one of the original seven deadly sins. Though acedia was not explicitly named in many of the lists of the sins of the Bible, a monk um, in 345 to 399 uh, AD, 
name was Averis Ponticus, one of the most gifted intellects of his day, compiled in the Greek from Scripture his list of the eight evil thoughts. In this order, Ponticus included gluttony, fornication, avarice, which is like greed, extreme greed, uh, hubris, which is like excessive pride, and then sadness and wrath, and then boasting. And the last one he listed was acedia. And acedia is listed last because Ponticus considered it the most troublesome of all. A short time later, another celebrated monk, John Cassian in 360 to 435 AD, translated Ponticus's list into Latin, but with slight uh, variances of the meanings. So Cassian's eight evil thoughts list was gluttony, fornication, uh, greed, pride, despair, wrath, vain glory, and acedia. Then 200 years later, uh, Gregorius Anicus in 540 uh, to 604 AD, and you know him as uh, the Pope Gregory the Great. And he's called by the Protestant reformer John Calvin, the last good pope, amen? <laughs> Um, but he compiles a list of sins derived from Cassius' list, which Anicus calls the seven deadlies. And you guys have heard of the seven deadly sins, right? That's where this comes from. In everyday terms, he combines pride and vainglory as one, as well as despair and acedia, and then he adds envy. And he changes fornication to uh, luxria, which expands the meaning from illicit sex to intense desire, or what we would know as lust. In uh, his mind, this could be a lust for power, food, drink, knowledge, money, and fame. And so therefore, in English, the very first list of the seven deadly sins is lust, gluttony, greed, acedia, wrath, envy, and pride. We know it got changed later to sloth. And when we think of sloth, we think of like laziness. But the original meaning of this deadly sin, if you will, was not responding to God's love. It was defined as a refusal to enjoy the goodness of God or to love him with all your heart. When we talk about acedia, we're talking about a study on falling out of love with God. Many with acedia seek to cure it by doing something new. You've heard of people get older, they get the midlife crisis, they buy a car, or they uh, go out, they cheat on their spouse, or they want some type of thrill in life. They're, they're trying to feel this lack of joy, this void that they feel because they refuse to accept the love of God all around them. Are you with me right here? So what biblically speaking causes acedia? And I've got two points. The first point is the stages that lead to acedia. Amen. The stages that lead to falling out of love with God. And I've got a couple subpoints. So the first stage is a failure to remember the death of Jesus. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And I appreciate Lucia doing communion. I thought it was incredible. And you saw her tears. You saw her passion. This is someone who's not struggling with a CD. Are you with me right here? And in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we read in verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. That's why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we're being disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. You know, here Paul writes to the church in Corinth, and he's trying to do a teaching on why we take communion. And he says, listen, communion is a time when you are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. Your focus on the fact that Jesus died for you when that bread and that juice come around. It's a time where you reflect and you examine yourselves and you bring your sin to the cross and you come before the Lord and with a pure heart and you remember his death and it moves you. Are you with me right here? And this time was commanded by our Lord Jesus. We know in Acts 20, verse seven, they took it on the first day of the week. So on Sundays, when the Lord resurrected, that's why we observe uh, communion on Sunday. Amen. 
And that's why you've got to be at church, amen? Because it was a time when we, the people would come together as one, and they would break that bread, which represents the body of Christ, and of course, the juice, the blood of Christ. And in the church, he says, you know, many of you are weak, sick, and have fallen asleep. And spiritually, this is the idea that they got weak spiritually. To be weak means you keep trying, but you fail. You're in the gym and you're weak. You're trying to lift the weight, but you can't. To be sick is like many of you. To be sick, amen? Uh, a lot of people were sick this week with different different symptoms and stuff. But, but when you're sick, it's contagious, right? When you're sick, it's you don't feel good. You feel lethargic. You don't want to get out of bed. It's hard to come to midweek or whatever, right? Then he says, fall asleep. And I think when Jesus says to the church in Revelation, you know, wake up, right? <laughs> He's like, you're spiritually asleep. This would be like acedia. You know, um, spiritually, when you're spiritually sick and when you're physically sick, can you really enjoy the good things around you? I mean, it's hard if you're physically sick to go to Six Flags, you know what I'm talking about, and get on a roller coaster or something like that. You're, you're probably not going to enjoy that very much. And yet when you're healthy and fine, that might be something you enjoy. And the idea with this is that to be spiritually sick, you can't enjoy the goodness of God. And you can't enjoy the goodness of his creation around you. When you're sick physically, you understand that it can spread to other people. And spiritually speaking, when someone's in acedia, oftentimes the fruit of it can be complaining, grumbling, struggling. This is the person where life's always hard. Being a Christian is always tough. Being a Christian is always about survival. And, you know, you're just struggling 24-7. I'm struggling. Everyone says that word, right? Um, what you're saying is you're weak spiritually. That's what we should say. I'm sick. I've fallen asleep. Struggling actually means you're doing good. <laughs> Because we're all in the fight. Are you with me right here? Yeah. Um, but but what you're saying is like, man, I, I'm just weak, apathetic. Yeah. The word of God doesn't move me anymore. Yeah. I'm not in awe at worship when I sing the songs anymore. My mind's already on what I got to do for the rest of the week. I can't stand in God's presence and be content, mm. meditative, contemplative on the glory of our great Lord and Savior. Um, how does this happen? You know, if you look in Proverbs chapter 13, how do you get spiritually sick? In Proverbs chapter 13, in verse 12, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. The way our heart gets spiritually sick is when we hope for something and that hope is deferred. For many of us, we thought our career might be at a different place than where we're at right now. And so our heart gets sick. Some people, are try, they try to have a child and they can't have one. And so their hope's deferred and their heart gets sick spiritually. Maybe you had a dream of doing the ministry. Or being selected for ICCM and you feel like you tried but you failed and you might feel overlooked and your hopes deferred and so your heart gets sick. Maybe you see everyone starting to date and get married in the church and there's all this love and every good news sharing. I want to lift up my girlfriend and I want to lift up my boyfriend and I want to lift up my husband and lift up my wife. You know, like, Bleh, you know what I mean? You're just kind of like every week, right? But you're struggling because there's just this like, I wish that was me. And and, and my hope has been deferred and it can lead to a sick heart. Have you hoped for something and it didn't turn out the way it was supposed to? We have to have our hope in God and the cross. And that never disappoints because we trust him. We trust his sovereignty. Um, it's no wonder that the church connected the idea of sloth with acedia because, like I said, when you're sick, physically you're lethargic, but when you're sick spiritually, you're lethargic. You ever like – and it's the weirdest thing. This is how we know we live in a spiritual realm. Have you ever sat there and just like tried to read your Bible and you can't? Yeah. Like I've had that happen before where I'm just kind of – it's like almost like I can't pray or something. It's just yeah. weird. Yeah. 
And then it's like Bible talk, and you're just like, okay, it's 6.45, okay, it's 6.50, I should probably get in the car at 7, you're just kind of scrolling mindlessly on social media or whatever, and you're just, and it's just like the hardest thing to get in your car and drive to Bible talk. There's just kind of this spiritual wall and this apathy, and the Bible says it's the Lord's discipline for not remembering the cross. And that's apathy. It gets brought into our life. The Bible says God does this to get our attention. To know something's not right. Something's wrong. And he says he disciplines us like that so we won't be judged on the final day. Are you with me right here? And so he goes, I wish you were more spiritually discerning in 1 Corinthians 11. It says that that you would discern your heart today and go, where am I at? Do I have a sedia or what some call it in the early church, the the noonday demon is what they would call it. Because it could just affect you all day, right? Well, we're going to look in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, as you're turning there, you know, for me personally, um, there were always two things I just wanted in life that I, I put my hope in for a long, t- long time. One, I wanted to be in the full-time ministry. Uh, from the time I was a teenager, uh, it was something I just couldn't wait until I was supported full-time by the church to preach the gospel. I mean... I hated working, you know, at the video store there. I worked at a science center for a while, and I did, you know, I hated all that stuff. All I thought about was the ministry, you know what I mean? And, and that was what I put my, my hope in. Um, the other thing that I wanted more than anything was to find the love of my life. And I put my hope in that. And she knows with Bellamy in the back. She's uh, sick today. Uh, Bellamy's sick today. Um, but... I put my hope in those 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 two things, and that's that's what I desire. That's what I I long for so much. And so when the ministry wasn't there for me, when I was let go of the ministry at different times, yeah. it's like my whole world crashed. Yeah. Enslavement to all kinds of sins, uh, wicked impurity, all kinds of things, depression, sadness. I remember living in Long Beach, California. It was probably one of the darkest times in my life. I had gotten out of the ministry because of foolishness uh, on my part. But to me, the ministry was like God. And because the ministry was destroyed, my hope in God was destroyed. And I just laid there in bed all the time. I tried to kind of hide it from my roommates and look like I was you know, sold out or whatever. But I would just lay in bed all day. And I remember one night it got so dark, I remember having a dream where like, there was like a gun on my pillow. And I had never had suicidal tendencies or thoughts. And it wasn't something I was really thinking about doing, but I just go, wow, I'm like depressed here. And I've got to figure this out. I went through relationship after relationship. I probably hold the record in the kingdom of God of the most (laughs) dating relationships. I dated seven different people in the church. Um, And Chanel, I dated like three times. So really I dated like 10 times. Amen. It took a... You know, third, third time's a charm, amen? And a lot of it was because these were my idols. This is what I longed for so much, to be loved and to, to have a, a woman that was my partner. And, and I would idolize them so much. And so when it didn't work out or they broke up with me or I broke up with them or whatever, um, I just felt empty. I felt sick spiritually. It was hard to be at church. It was hard to... Uh, love and give to others. I didn't want to go on encouragement dates with people I didn't like. You know what I mean? I was just kind of like, no. I, I, like, my, my, my hope was destroyed. I couldn't enjoy the goodness of other people. I couldn't enjoy the goodness of just taking a sister out as a friend and encouraging her. I couldn't enjoy that, that, the, the goodness of God around me and the fellowship. And, you know, the sicker you get, the harder it is to serve others. Someone needs help moving. You're kind of like, no, nah, I'm busy that day, you know, playing video games or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, like you just check out. Um, this sickness can get so bad that it can kill you spiritually. Yeah. And that's what it means. Falling asleep was a euphemism for death. It's the idea of falling away spiritually, being uh, spiritually severed. And, and it's, it's I believe the monk salt is the most troublesome because it's something that kind of like progressively sneaks up on you. Right. It's kind of like cancer. It gets worse and worse and worse and worse over time. It's not, and Satan knows it, brothers and sisters. 
it, it's not one of those things. Like for a lot of us, you know, Satan doesn't need to send some drug dealer to knock on your door and go, here you go. You know what I mean? You're going to be like, okay, that's crazy. Even if you had a pass in it, like that's weird. Yeah. Prostitute comes to your door. Or something. You know what I mean? They're like, yeah, I had an immoral pass. So that's weird. Yeah. Um, but Satan plays the long game. And, and he knows he, he works on that heart to get you spiritually apathetic and you can't enjoy church anymore. I, I remember uh, I had my eyes all on people like, why is that guy in the ministry? And I'm not. Why is that guy? A new Christian gets baptized. OK, we'll see how long he sticks around. Your idealism is gone where you once had a passion for taking the world for Christ. And now you're deep in acedia. So in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 14, one of the things that I had to get discipled on and it took years to, to really grasp this was that I had never really learned how to just be present and enjoy and be content with everything God's given me. Mm-hmm. To be grateful, to be thankful. Remember the story of the 10 lepers that come to Jesus? And then, um, of course, you know, Jesus heals them, but only one comes back to show gratitude and worship. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he's like, where are the others? You know, uh, Acedia becomes very selfish. Yeah. And you're constantly thinking about how you feel. Mm-hmm. And then the church becomes a place where the church is here to serve me. Mm-hmm. And it becomes a consumer mindset versus a communal mindset. Right. And so in 2 Corinthians 5, this We saw, number one, we fail to remember the death of Jesus. So this is a stage that leads to acedia. Secondly, we saw a hope gets deferred, a dream we had, something that doesn't happen the way we wanted it to. And thirdly, we find in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14, it says, For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. The third stage that happens is we refuse to be moved by love. And this is an interesting concept. Um, I've known people, for example, no matter how much I show them love, maybe you can think of like a woman. Sometimes you could go, you can tell them over and over again, like, you're beautiful. You look great. You're awesome. But no matter what, they refuse to accept it. Um, I love you, bro. I believe in you. You can do this. But there's a refusal to accept it and to just stay in acedia. So accepting love is an interesting concept because we talk about giving love a lot. But do you accept the love of others? And the Bible says the love of Christ is what compels you. So I'm here this morning not because I'm some you know super righteous dude or something. I'm here this morning because the overall love that's been showed to me on the cross motivates me to be here. I'm not here because I'm compelled by a discipleship partner. I'm not here because I'm compelled by a mentor in my life. I'm not compelled by, well, you know, I better come to church next Sunday because Daniel's being sent out. No, I'm going to be there anyway, and I'm going to be involved in people's lives daily because Christ died for me. And Christ loved me. So does Christ's love compel you? God's love has a claim over us, so when we read our Bibles and pray, we can serve and follow him. The less we feel moved by love, the more discouraged and feelings of unhappiness come into our hearts. It's usually here that we become increasingly negative about our circumstances. And so the next stage is a willful focus on the negative. Go to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 14. The Bible says, do some things without grumbling or arguing. Oh. No, amen. It says, do everything without grumbling or arguing. I, I believe the old translation said, do everything without complaining. Amen. <laughs> do everything without grumbling and arguing. Verse 15, it says, so that you may become blameless and pure. Children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I'll be able to boast on that day of Christ that I did not run or labor 
in vain. Amen. Amen. And he goes on to talk about how he's being poured out. I mean, this is amazing. This is a man, Paul, that was motivated by the love of Christ. And you just look at his life. For him, it was all about the cross. Are you with me right here? I mean, he just loved God, loved people, endured stoning and beatings and shipwrecks. And this man was just moved by the love of Christ. You know, grumbling and complaining is not for Christians. When we grumble or we complain, whether in our homes, to our spouses, to our buddy that's a Christian, it is a direct disobedience to a command in the scriptures. So there is no place for grumbling and complaining. I want to challenge you to do a complaining fast. And tell people around you so they can listen to you go, hey, bro, you're starting to complain again. See if you can go seven days without complaining about anything. Someone, you get stuck in traffic, you're like, this. I'm just grateful that I have a car, amen. And you're going to renew your mind with the scriptures. How do you do this? Well, if you go to Philippians chapter 4, and verse 8, it says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. I like the Holman translation says, dwell on such things. Amen. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. So we see two things here. He goes, number one, focus on the good. Look for the positives. Guys, this will change your life. I remember when Chanel and I were going through some marriage struggles uh, before, uh, I think we had moved to New York at that point. And I went down to Florida, and there's a brother named Will Pena down there that uh, hosted this kind of emotional mastery workshop. And this concept changed my marriage forever. Like, I think about it all the time because it literally is the one thing that like really changed our dynamic because I think Chanel and I were were best buddies. We were good friends, but um, I was lacking. I I looked at all the critical things, the things that, that, you know, pet peeves or whatever. And the brother gets up there and he goes, he draws a pie chart, kind of like our logo, like a big circle, right? And he goes, you know, my wife... When we got married, he drove it through like a, a little um, little piece of pie, and he put inside that piece of pie uh, something like, you know, the positives I saw were like 5%, something ridiculous. Now, I didn't think that of Chanel at the time, amen? <laughs> and then the other 95%, he goes, those are all the problems I focused on. He goes, you know, I made a decision to only think about that 5%. And dwell on that and to stop even caring. Like he literally said, I don't even focus on the things that are wrong. That's good. Like I just forget about it. Who cares? Right. And he focused on that. And then he said, now, if I remember right, it was like now, you know, the whole graph was like up and there's like 2% or something. And then there was like, you know, 98% all positive about how he felt about his marriage. And this revolutionized uh, my marriage because it wasn't, the problem wasn't with Chanel. It was just that I was ascetic in my marriage. Focusing on negative things. But now I can say to this day that I genuinely don't think anything negative of her. Like at all. I'm being completely honest and transparent. I I think she's the most beautiful, more beautiful than she's ever been today. I think she's the most amazing person. And I I can say that before the Lord. And it's sad. A lot of spouses can't say that. And they're focused on the negatives. And I want to challenge you. To fast from the negatives. Stop willfully focusing on the negative. You have to fight this sin in your thinking. The battle of Christianity is in the mind. The battle of Christianity is in the mind. And you must decide, I'm going to pour myself out like Paul. I'm going to be a giver. I'm going to be someone who looks for the good. Amen? The next stage is a refusal to see God as good. This is a big one. Because when everything crashed in my life, you know who I was bitter at? God. And I didn't even recognize it. Kim McKean was discipling me at the time. And I remember we went out to uh, go get some pie or something random. And we're sitting there. And I always remember, he's like, Mike, here's your problem. 
He's like, you're bitter. I'm like, I'm not bitter. Because I've never been a person that like gets mad, starts cursing out people or throwing things around. You know, in my mind, when I think of bitter, I think of, uh, you guys remember the, uh, uh, the bitter beer face? <laughs> anyway, a couple of, that's past my time. But anyway, they used to have this commercial where someone drinks, this guy would drink this bitter beer, you know, and his face would be, you know, get all contorted. So you look it up on Google or whatever. <laughs> Um, but, but so when I thought of bitter, I thought of someone like that is just mad, a grumpy old man or something. And, and then for me, Kip's like, no, bro, you're bitter because you're depressed. Depression is a symptom of bitterness. You're, you're bitter at, and I'm not talking about clinical depression. I'm talking about when you're sad, you're bitter at something that you hope for that God didn't give you. And you look at God as the problems. People that, that fall away, guess what the number one reason why people fall away? In my opinion. Yeah, there's persecution, there's sexual immorality, but what's the deep-rooted sin that even produces those? Bitterness. Like, it's crazy. I've seen the most loving people leave the church, and they hate the church. Like, hate you. Literally, I've had people that I once loved and once served me, like, threaten me and my family. And they just want to burn the church down. It's, like, insane. But this is just someone that had acedia and allowed it to brew and a brew, and they refuse to see God as good. Yeah. In Psalm 88, did I tell you guys to go there already? Or did? Oh, okay, okay, good. Psalm 88, in verse 13, the Bible says here, we're going to see a brother who's uh, suffering from acedia here in this passage. It says in Psalm 88, verse 13, but I cry to you for help, Lord. In the morning, my prayer comes before you. Why, Lord, do you reject me and hide your face from me? From my youth, I've suffered and been close to death. I've borne your tears and I am in despair. Your wrath has swept over me. Your tears have destroyed me. All day long, they surround me like a flood. They have completely engulfed me. You have taken from me, friend and neighbor. Darkness is my closest friend. And that's how he ends his prayer there. Amen. God, this guy's really struggling right here. Amen. And he says, darkness is my closest friend. Your tears. And I love the Psalms, guys, because the Psalms show us you can be real with your God. Sometimes I think we have to like, you know, someone starts praying in King James language or something weird. And it's like, bro, you don't even talk like that, dude, in real life. You know, dear God, let your oracles, you know, come into me, thou shalt love, whatever, you know. God doesn't want that. He wants a real relationship with you. And he wants you to pour out how you're really feeling. And this guy's in a dark place. So just because you read the Psalms doesn't mean they're doing well spiritually. Not like, okay, I'm doing pretty good. I'm like that guy. No, that, that, this guy's struggling spiritually. But it proves to us that he went to the Lord. And this guy wasn't feeling loved. All his, he felt like darkness was his closest friend. You ever felt alone? Yeah. And you know, it, it's intense. Because for me, um, I struggled growing up feeling emotionally close to my father. And, and a lot of this roots back to my biological father I didn't know. I was adopted when I was four years old. Because my biological father took his life um, when I was around seven uh, because of drugs and different things. And so for me, it was challenging because I didn't feel emotionally close to my dad. And uh, my brother, in my mind, seemed very close to him. They were kind of very similar uh, in my mind. I was kind of the weird, creative, artsy one, emotional one, I felt like, you know. And I felt this, this kind of just distance, right? And it showed out in me in depression. I got into a lot of impurity. I didn't treat my brother well when I was young. Um, And a lot of these things came out. And so when I come to the church for the first time, I saw families. I saw people that were loving. And my parents had gone through a divorce. And that that, that pain hit me hard. I'll, I'll never forget sitting in therapy one time. And just, I was literally sitting there and the guy just starts talking. We're talking about different events in my life. And I just like broke down weeping as a grown man about my parents' divorce. And I had no idea how much it had impacted me. And so when I came into the church, I remember uh, these families that would take me into their house. And I saw parents that had kids that were faithful and these families and they were fired up. And it was just something I'd never experienced before. And I fell in love with the church. Yeah. 
And then in 2002, when the church crashed and crumbled and our former fellowship went back to a mainline Church of Christ type theology that caused autonomy and division and people having yelling matches with each other and the church split. And praise God, our new movement came out of that. But at the time, there was just craziness. It was like I was going through a divorce again. And I was devastated. I got into so much just wicked sins and trying to figure out uh, what to do with my life. My mom had left the church and that that broke my heart when when I was young. So all this happened. And for a while, it was hard to go. God, are you good? Like, where are you right now? I feel alone. I remember deciding to move to Portland. I was alone. I didn't think Franklin came with me, amen. <laughs> but but I just remember being in this new church, starting a new life, like just trying to find the truth, yeah. trying to find the church I was baptized into, trying to find that family again. And it was amazing coming to Portland and finding it, and that God did a special thing there to now have a worldwide movement that has that same conviction and family again. Are you with me right here, guys? You know, here's the thing: the less we feel loved, the more intense our feelings of darkness will be. And we need to accept the love of God in our lives. And this is a, it's something, guys, I've not arrived or I'm not like the perfect, you know, most happiest person on the planet or something like that. Th- these are things that are I'm learning and I'm growing in. But I have learned some things over the years. And this is probably the biggest thing I could ever tell you. I'll never forget. God used a brother named Mike Underhill. Who I went to a Hope Youth Corps, uh, a Hope Youth Corps event in 2001 in the ICOC. Um and he was speaking. He leads one of our churches in Honolulu, I believe. And he comes and he said, listen, you know something? He goes, the only thing you're really promised, the only thing that you have in this life, he goes, I always just think of this. The only reward I have is God. So then for me, any like blessing is just icing on the cake. And for some reason that stuck with me. I was like 16 years old. And it just like I kept it with me and I always go back to that fundamental conviction and concept. You know, if you go to Hebrews chapter 12. In uh, Hebrews chapter 12. You know, this darkness can keep going and we look for hope even in the Bible and we can't find it. Praying seems pointless. We believe God's given up on us. And we look to others' sins to fulfill us. We can become superstitious. What do I mean? Someone quits studying the Bible that you're studying with, you go, man, must be God's not with me. God's left me because my, my Bible talk's not growing. I'm not chosen by the Lord anymore because, you know, I gave into this sin this week. That's so satanic. And we focus on the negatives. Listen, if you're with God, God's with you. Amen. <laughs> and that can always just be a decision in a moment. That's the mighty grace of our God. Amen. So the next stage that leads to Asidia is, and these aren't, in, by the way, in any like descending order or anything like that. But this is another stage. It says uh, uh, in Hebrews 12, verse 7. The stage is bitterness towards man and God. And Hebrews 12, verse 7, it says, endure hardship as discipline. God's treating you as his children, for what children are not disciplined by their fathers? If you're not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you're not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we've all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good, in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. And the church said, you know, the Bible says here, God disciplines his children. And this is why your relationship with your father growing up is so important or your lack of relationship with your father, because you're going to bring that in the church. All of us do. And he goes, you know, they, they disciplined you as, the, as, as they saw best. Now, I find those who didn't have their father's discipline in their life growing up are the ones that reject authority and don't understand it in the church. Yeah. It, it's, just a, it's just hard for them to, 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 to gather. And he says, hey, God's discipline is perfect. 
God, God is your father. And so part of being a great disciple is you've got to restudy out what it means to have a godly father. Yeah. So you can see God is your father because he disciplines his children. He goes, if you're not disciplined, you're, you're not real, really his children. And a lot of Christians struggle with, well, well, why is that guy in the world that's not a Christian? His life's just great. He's got the car. He's got the girl. He's got the muscles. He's got, and, and you forget, guys, that's not God's child. So I believe God disciplines his church, Christians, more than he does the world because Satan already has them. I always tell people, it's like I don't go and discipline Anthony Franklin's kids. Like, you know. God might intervene sometimes. I mean, if one of their kids runs in the street or something, I might grab them and say no, because I love their family. But at the end of the day, I'm focused on disciplining my child. And we live in this sick world that's like gotten so far away with all this dumb garbage about how you raise your kids by not disciplining them. I won't, you know, I don't ever spank your kids. Just only tell them positive things. Never. Dis- and it's like, dude, have you looked at the world around us? Is this actually working? No. But you have therapists that tell you this garbage. And, and listen, you know, at, at the end of the day, I'm getting off topic here, but but let's get back to Hebrews chapter 12. This is a parenting workshop. Amen. He says, endure hardship as all all hardship as discipline. So whatever you're going through in your life right now, that's hard. God's trying to train you. He's trying to teach you something. And he says, if you endure it and you accept the discipline of God, you will grow as a Christian. He says, you will strengthen yourself under it and you'll be able to heal the disabled. He's he's using a symbol of saying you're going to be fruitful. You're going to be able to touch other people's lives because enduring God's discipline produces a harvest of peace and righteousness and holiness. And let's all be honest, guys. At the end of the day, we've all had really good moments in our lives and really bad moments in our lives. But you know what I value the most is the times I had peace. Yeah. And I've had peace at times when I've had like uh, barely anything. And then, I, I, you know, it's funny, you know, Chanel and I, I, I for so long had the dream to be a geographic sector leader. I was like just a kingdom dream and, and not not from sometimes it'd be selfish and other times it would be godly. You know, you know how that is. Kind of sometimes it goes, goes back and forth. And, and I wanted to just like oversee uh, uh, a part of the world because I wanted to have a huge impact with my life. Like I wanted to change the world for Christ. Amen. Amen. But I remember when we got appointed afterwards, it's kind of like, OK. And then we flew, flew back from Jerusalem and this mountaintop experience, you know, and then it was kind of like all this persecution came towards us. There's lawsuits there's all this. stuff, And I'm just like, what in the world just happened? <laughs> We had a rough start, you know, with some fallaways in our church this year and different things. I'm just going, amen, that didn't bring me peace. My relationship with Christ is what brings me peace. And God will bring hardship to try to teach you these things and remind you, where do you get your strength and your joy from? It's not from your position at work. It's not from your title in the church. It's not from who you're married to. or your, It's all from God. See, God is sovereign. This means either everything in your life, either God makes happen or he allows to happen. And when you live like that, there's no way you can get bitter. Look in chapter 12, verse 14. You guys still with me? All right. Verse 14 says, make every effort to live at peace with. I'm sorry. Let me try it again. Verse 14. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up. To cause trouble and defile many. When hardship comes, you have a choice. You can get bitter or you can get better. I'm going to choose the better side. Bitterness will cause you to miss the grace of God. Remember, you can't accept love. That's why you you guys have seen, I I don't, I probably, you know, I'm not going to go through name people, but you've seen people that are bitter in the church. And people try to love them. It's like trying to hug like a, a, a porcupine or a hedgehog or something, you know what I mean? And it's like almost a struggle to love them because that, that bitterness like defiles others. And then now you're bitter at them, their bitterness, you know what I'm saying? And, and it's just kind of this plague that spreads throughout the church. Listen, here's the deal. If, if there's someone in the fellowship, you know how it is. And you go, I'm not bitter. That, that's kind of a thing people say. I got a message recently. Someone sent me this long thing. They're like, well, I'm not bitter. Blah, blah, you know what I mean? All this stuff. And I'm like, oh my 
gosh, dude, like, this is one of the most bitter things I've seen in a long time. And, um, but we deceive ourselves, right? And you know you're bitter if there's someone in the fellowship that comes in, you're hugging everybody, but then it comes to that person, you're kind of like, amen. I, you know, I love them, I just don't like them. Ever heard of that one? I'm grateful that Jesus, you know, didn't just like, I love him, but I don't like him. That wouldn't be a fun relationship with the Lord. But Jesus liked me too, amen? You say, well, how can you like someone you don't get along with? Well, I, every single person is made in the image of God. Yeah. And every single person has value. Yeah. And part of being a great Christian is seeing value in people. Mm-hmm. Wisdom's the ability to recognize what makes someone different. Right. And that gift that they have, God wants to use in his kingdom. Are you with me right here? Yeah. And you got to go back to the little pie chart by Will Pena and focus on the positives. So, are you bitter towards someone? Are you refusing to accept God's discipline in your life? Together, we must look at Jesus in hard times, difficulty, pain, emptiness, dryness, believing because of Jesus' promises that he will be sufficient for us. And there's a passage in the Bible. I can't remember where it's at. Someone can maybe send it in the group chat or something. If, but, but it's, it's a, a passage where it says God left them to test them to see what they would do and what was in their heart. Is it Deuteronomy? Okay. There's one in Chronicles, though, a different one I'm thinking of. I know the Deuteronomy 8 one. Um, but anyway, essentially the idea is that, that sometimes there's periods of dryness and emptiness, and you're going to pray for hours and walk away feeling the same. And God is doing that to test your loyalty. Because it isn't like that in marriage sometimes or in any relationship. There's times of dryness. There's times of things. You're going on dates and you just kind of, you know, uh, sit there and kind of stare at each other. What do we talk about here? <laughs> I remember early on in our ministry, our marriage is funny because like all Chanel and I, all I talked to about with Chanel was the ministry. And Matt's like, bro, can you like just, you know, turn off the ministry when you go on a date with your wife and like, Talk to her. I remember that was so challenging. And I'm sitting there like, what do I talk about? But it was a good challenge because my relationship got deeper, amen. <laughs> and, and, and now we're at a place where we just know each other at such a deeper level and, and, and it's fun. And I actually like turning off the ministry now, amen. I used to like not like doing that. So with this um, bitterness, one of the things that you've got to do is you've got to look to Christ and how much he's forgiven you. Yes. Having to face something hard is not a sign of God's disfavor towards you. Yes. The nail marks in Jesus' hands were a sign of his victory, yes. not disfavor. Yes. Have you refused God's goodness? Do you have a conviction on this? You refuse to enjoy Bible study, refuse to enjoy meetings of the body, refuse to enjoy creation? Refuse to enjoy material blessings God's given you. Refuse to accept encouragement from others. Refuse to enjoy prayer. Uh, Refuse to enjoy the relationships in the body. Um, Listen, sometimes you know you're bitter when there's distrust. There's someone recently I asked someone to do something in the church and I was shocked because they they, they felt like you're you're manipulating me. And I'm like, what in the world? Like, no, I actually thought it'd be really awesome to hear a speech from you. But okay, let's deal with this. What's going on here? Um, but again, I think that's something that takes root and then it defiles how we see encouragement, um, refusal to enjoy sharing your faith and why? Well, when you're bitter, you don't have faith to share (laughs) refusal to enjoy your spouse, refusal to enjoy your roommates, go, ah, dude, this guy left the dishes out again or all the milk's gone or so you ever been there? And uh, and you guys need to repent that are doing that, amen. There should be no dishes left in a disciple's sick, amen. So everyone's really, like first time everyone clapping the sermon, you know. I'm like, hey amen. That's not that deep, but that's okay. Let's close with the cure to acedia. Yeah, okay. I know what acedia is now. Can you tell me how to get out of it, amen? <laughs> Let's look in uh, Genesis chapter 4, the first uh, case of Acedia. 
in uh, Genesis chapter 4. The Bible says in verse 1, Adam made love to his wife, Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother, Abel. Now, Abel kept the flocks and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. But on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. So we see here his bitterness didn't show in some type of rage and yelling. It showed in downcast. A CDL. Verse 6 it says, Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin's crouching at your door and it desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, Let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. He became the first murderer in history. The cure for acedia. Well, we find here that Cain was very angry and downcast. Why? Well, he felt like God was pleased with his brother's sacrifice, but wasn't pleased with his. And, you know, God taught animal sacrifice from the beginning. If you look in Genesis 3, verse 21... Even though the law hadn't been given yet, in Genesis 3, verse 21, it says, The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And so God, even when Adam and Eve sinned and were cast out, God still showed his mercy by performing the first animal sacrifice and clothing them with animal skins, foreshadowing the clothing of the blood of Christ and his righteousness. Amen? And so most likely Adam and Eve then taught his children how to Sacrifice. Now, what was always required for atonement? A blood sacrifice. So you have one that brings Cain, just, you know, the, 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 the fruits of the garden or whatever. And then you have the other who, Abel, brings a costly sacrifice. A blood sacrifice. Look in Hebrews 11, verse 4. In Hebrews 11, 4, we learn now why God approved um, Abel's sacrifice. And back then, the way that he, that he knew it was approved, his fire would come down from heaven and consume the sacrifice. And so in Hebrews 11, verse 4, it says, By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks, even though he is dead. This shows us that Abel, what he gave, was offered in faith. Amen? And notice that in Genesis uh, 4, verse 3, it said, in the course of time. You see, Cain became apathetic towards God. He did not enjoy the goodness of God. And so he didn't give to God in faith and didn't give a costly sacrifice, but a cheap one. And verse 6 in Genesis 4 is the key to overcoming acedia. He says, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? He just needed to do the right thing. You know, I put before you, sometimes it's actions that change the hearts. And our false Christian culture sometimes tells us, well, I've got to get my heart in the right place and pray about before I actually obey God. No. The Bible says if you do what is right, you'll be accepted by God. You know, when you're living righteously, don't you just feel more like, man, I'm accepted by God. And it's not that God didn't accept him, guys. Remember, our parents, we were their children, right? But you know, when you were disobedient to them, you didn't really feel their favor, did you? But when you're obedient, there's peace with your parents. That's the same way with God. He goes, do what is right. But if you don't, sin's crouching at your door. It desires to rule over you. He goes, you must master it. You must master it. You know, we've got our special missions contribution coming up. And are you going to give a sacrifice in faith? That's costly that God goes, I approve of this. I decided, you know, we got paid the other day. I was like, amen, let me give some more to special mission. I want to go beyond my goal. 
Because I love our gods. And I have faith. And, and I don't want to bring them the spare change like Cain did. I, I want to give my best to God. You know, for today, a lot of us, we're going to pray for in a moment for the contribution. And then we'll close with a baptism. But as we pray, uh, I want you to really think about, am I going to give what I committed and pledged to give this past Wednesday? Or can I exceed even above that? Amen. Amen. By doing what is right. You got to master your sins. Some of you are spiritually sick. You need to put your hope in God today. Start doing what you know is right. You know, it was crazy. Um, No matter how much I prayed at one point in my life, no matter how much I had discipleship times, no matter how many periods of fruitlessness, I just refused to enjoy communion with God. And I remember I knew I was sick spiritually. I said, I got to order some communion supplies. And I just started taking communion before I went to work. I was out of the ministry at this point. That was part of my acedia. And I would just sit on my porch in my apartment. I lived in the hood in South Central at the time. Um, you guys know the road story there, amen? So but I'd wake up in the morning, and I would sit out there, and I would just take the communion every day before I, I went to work. Because I just was like, I don't feel anything right now. But I just, I just want to learn more about you. I'll never forget, I studied the blood of Christ, just the blood all throughout the scriptures. And, and it just was a life-changing moment for me where I understood grace in a deeper way than I'd ever have in my life. And I started just getting content with God. I started getting righteous. I was doing what was right, even when I didn't feel like it. There had been so much sin and impurity, I couldn't sleep sometimes because I just felt so tempted like a drug addict. And I just like, I'm going to do what's right because I don't want to fail God. And the Lord put me back in the ministry. The Lord allowed me to start dating Chanel again. And from that point, it was a right relationship. And we got married. We went in the ministry. We went on a mission. I mean, God just all started with a decision to start taking communion. Are you with me right here? Communion is not something you just have to do on Sunday. Chanel and I have taken communion together when we were going through things in our marriage. Uh, you can take communion with your, your, your discipleship group, with your Bible talk. This could be a good time. You know, in Luke chapter 10, if you'll turn there. The usher is telling me i, I got to stop here soon, amen? <laughs> I'm just kidding. All right, in Luke chapter 10, we'll close with this. In Luke 10. And if you guys are interested more in this, I can send you some um, articles uh, that, that have been written that, are, that go deeper into this. Just message me. Um, I have a fuller version of this sermon um, that goes through a lot more scriptures. And just message me for the link and I can send it to you guys. Amen. Here in Luke 10, uh, the last point. So number one, do what is right. And number two, in Luke 10 and verse 38, it says, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way. He came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sisters left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. You're worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Martha refused to enjoy the goodness of the presence of the Son of God. She was worried about all the things that the Bible says had to get done. So there are things that have to get done in our lives. Amen? But he goes, Martha, Martha. And when Jesus says your name twice, it's a sign of disapproval. Like, that's why Simon, Simon, you know, and and Peter betrayed him, all that. Um, He goes, Mary's chosen the one thing that matters. Sitting at the feet of Christ and listening to him. Being in the present. And so that's the second key. Be in the present. Be in the presence. Amen. Amen. (laughs) Um, Doing the right thing is not enough. You must engage in the right things. Mary was doing things that need to get done, yet refused to engage in the moment of enjoying Jesus. Have we been refusing our quiet times in the morning? That moment where we can sit at Jesus' feet. Before all the things we need to get done. Are you aware of your surroundings? Are you distracted? You know, I confess, sometimes uh, my my hardest time as a minister is is after church ends. Because, or especially after our staff meetings, the worst. Um, Because everyone comes up to me with all these questions and needs. And, you know, I need help with the benevolence here. I need this. I need that. You know know what I'm saying? So I have to prepare myself mentally. 
Um, but one of the things I struggled with in the past is sometimes someone would be talking to me and I'd be like, wow, that's crazy. <laughs> wow, crazy. Dang. Okay. If I'm doing that, you know I'm not actually really listening. But I'd already be like thinking in my head what's going on. And then sometimes a brother and sister walk away and I'm like, I have no idea what they talk to me about. <laughs> Acedia makes you not in the present. You can't just enjoy what's going on. You forget people's names you meet. You don't, they're not on your heart. You forget to follow up with people you reached out to to come to church. You know what I'm saying? Like, because we're not living and engaged in the present. This part can be a selfish part of us that, that is the gasoline to acedia. So as we get into the summer, guys, it's so easy to get into the sins of sloth, gluttony, and acedia. And we need to do the right thing to be accepted by God, to engage in the present and walk in the spirit. A Christian song that I like, I'm not a big fan of a lot of Christian songs, but uh, it's by a guy named Matthew West called The Motions. And I I like these lyrics because it's always a reminder for me. It says, this might hurt, it's not safe, but I know that I've got to make a change. I don't care if I break, at least I'll be feeling something. Because just okay is not enough. Help me fight through the nothingness of life. I don't want to go through the motions. I don't want to go one more day without your all-consuming passion inside of me. I don't want to spend my whole life asking, what if I'd given everything instead of going through the motions? No regrets. Not this time. I'm going to let my heart defeat my mind. Let your love make me whole. I think I'm finally feeling something. Because just okay is not enough. Help me fight through the nothingness of this life. Because I don't want to go through the motions. I don't want to go one more day without your all-consuming passion inside of me. I don't want to spend my whole life asking, what if I'd given everything instead of going through the motions? Take me all the way, because I don't want to go through the motions. Take me all the way. Lord, I'm finally feeling something real. Take me all the way. I don't want to go through the motions. I don't want to go one more day without your all-consuming passion inside of me. I don't want to spend my whole life asking, what if I'd given everything instead of going through the motions? As I pray for our contribution here today, I want to encourage you, don't go through the motions. What if you gave everything to our Lord and decided, I'm going to do what's right. I'm going to be engaged in the present. My challenge for you, brothers and sisters, this week is to every day write down 10 things you're grateful for. As you go for through your complaining fast. Amen. (laughs) Ten things you're grateful for. And let's give God the glory. Not fall out of love. Get rid of spiritual apathy. And let's be passionate for our God. And to God be the glory. Amen.